Hi, my name is Hans Janssen, and I would like to thank Oxford Nano for, for providing me the opportunity to present our work here and explain why we are finally fulfilling a promise. More than a decade ago, we started sequencing the King Cobra genome. And why did we do this? So we know that uh, more than 100,000 people are uh, killed by snake bite each year, and even more are left with amputation and disabilities. Um, they could have benefited from a safe and uh, synthetic antivenom that is readily available everywhere. And the genome could be a resource that help uh, research uh, into such a uh, synthetic antivenom. And the snake venom itself is also a rich source of bioactive proteins and peptides, which can be uh, used as leads in further drug development. And also from an evolutionary aspect, the King Cobra genome is interesting uh, because one of the toxin genes uh, has expanded uh, to a large number in the King Cobra. And we are curious to know why uh, the Cobra did this and how. So we started more than a decade ago uh, with short read sequences. Uh, but unfortunately, we could not resolve the genomic structure uh, of these three finger toxin genes uh, with short reads. An explanation is in the graph uh, to the right, where we see uh, the size distribution of the contigs in yellow and the scaffolds in blue. And the contig have an, uh, bulk of the, the contigs has a size of between 1,000 and 10,000 base pairs. And when we add the mate pair uh, information, uh, this shifts to the right uh, to between uh, 100,000 and a million base pairs. But you can also see that a fraction of uh, the contexts and scaffolds remain at uh, between uh, 100 and 300 uh, base pairs. And that is exactly where we find the three finger toxin genes. So we needed long reads to resolve the, the three finger toxin gene uh, structure. Uh, so when the MinIN access program opened in 2014, we proposed to sequence the King Cobra genome and resolve those structures. Unfortunately, when we received the first R6 flow cells, uh, this turned out to be a very ambitious project for the platform at that time. And only now with the latest base colors and the amount of data we can generate, uh, we have finished uh, generating the data. And in a total, uh, we sequenced uh, in genomic DNA, about uh, 74 gigabase pairs. And after processing data, uh, we were left with uh, 47.4 gigabase pairs. So we lost quite a lot. Uh, that also had uh, an impact on the read N50, which dropped from almost 32 KB to just under 25 KB. And most of the data we generated with the new LSK 110 kit. Uh, but also this is where most of the data was lost again. And we, next to that, we also sequenced uh, uh, RNA uh, in form of cDNA from a tissue pool and generated 14.7 gigabase pairs of cDNA data, also with the new LSK110 kit. Um, this is where uh, the 110 kit really shines because we didn't have to refuel, even though the reads are short and translocation speed uh, during the run uh, was kept at a nice uh, 400 base pairs per second. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the flow cells that we uh, used were from a batch that was later retracted, and so they didn't last as long uh, as they should have, so we could have generated even more data. Uh, so the read and 50 for the cDNA data was uh, 1.7 KB, and we used this for annotation of the, the genome. So about this last data, uh, what, is, what is going on here? So what we noticed with the reads that are filtered out is that uh, the first part of such a read aligns very well with a high identity. And then the second part uh, aligns at the same place, but on the opposite strand, but with a much lower identity. And that is also uh, seen in the quality score of the read, where the first part of the read has a normal uh, quality score, but all of a sudden uh, this drops to a lower level. And from uh, initial research that uh, we and Oxford Nanopore uh, did to this problem, uh, we think that this is a more a DNA related problem uh, than a sample kit related problem. And uh, for instance, what could be going on is that the DNA uh, is very old. Uh, so it has been in the minus 80 for more than uh, 10 years. So this could have affected uh, uh, the sequencing process and therefore we see this phenomenon. Um, 
we used uh, at the moment a very rough method uh, to remove the low quality parts of these reads. Uh, we uh, take a 100 nucleotide window and uh, calculate the average quality score in this window, and then slide it across the read. And as soon as the uh, quality score drops below a certain threshold, uh, then we remove the remainder of the read. And that's how we lost uh, a lot of the reads. I almost finished the tool uh, that does this by looking at k-mers, and I hope that this will uh, save more uh, reads which are not really uh, having this problem. We use this data in uh, three different tools. Uh, Fly and Redbean are uh, assemblers that uh, are based on, uh, on uh, the brown graph, or the brown-like graphs, uh, which allows for approximate sequencing matching. And their own tool, uh, tool Tulip, uh, is based on an overlap layout consensus strategy. And here we make alignments of reads between uh, the reads and only a subset of the genome. So this scales very well uh, to very large genomes. And after a graph is constructed, we simplify it and then um, find a linear path. And then the conflicts are produced by uh, stitching parts of reads together, uh, but also all the contributing reads to a contact are written uh, to a separate file. So you can still use these reads to uh, do a separate assembly. And uh, due to uh, uh, the process itself, uh, we need further correction and polishing because uh, we only use the, the raw reads uh, to make the context. So all three tools uh, agree to what the genome size more or less should be. It is around one and a half gigabase pairs. Uh, Fly uh, produced the most contiguous assembly with an assembly in 50 of 27.8 megabase pairs in uh, 61 contexts and uh, some scaffolds. Uh, Tulip produced uh, many less contexts, uh, but the assembly in 50 was also uh, lower with almost 13 megabase pairs. And Redbean produced uh, many more contexts. Of the smaller uh, because the assembly N50 is uh, over one just over four megabase pairs. Uh, we compared those assemblies and used Fly as a reference on the x axis and compared them in the first member plot uh, to the Tulip assembly. And here we can see that uh, Tulip and Fly mostly agree, uh, but uh, Tulip seems to be compressing uh, sequences into one context, which Fly doesn't. Uh, and the Redbean assembly uh, also agrees very well with Fly, uh, but Redbean produced many small contexts which are not found uh, in, the, in the Fly assembly. So we continued with the Fly assembly and start looking for uh, the genomic structure of these uh, three finger toxin genes. Um, and these genes are contain three exons and ex uh, encode uh, a small a protein with a hydrophobic core and three sing fingers and those uh, the sequences in those sing fingers determine the target of the protein. Uh, in the king cobra uh, these genes have duplicated many times and they have diversified uh, their targets uh, due to an evolutionary arms race uh, because we know that prey gets resistant uh, to toxins and then the snake has to change a toxin to be able to catch that prey again. And we found uh, for the moment at least 32 of those genes uh, spread across two contexts and the scaffold. And most of the genes were found on the scaffold, uh, but we haven't completed the annotation yet. Uh, so there could be even more of those genes. And the scaffold was uh, almost 52 megabase pairs long. And uh, most of the genes are found in three clusters of the ends uh, of the scaffold. And for that, the cDNA data is very handy. If you have the possibility, and because with this data, uh, you can resolve the complete gene structures. Uh, you also have access to alternative splicing if that is happening in your gene. Uh, and this together leads to a much better annotation of the complete genome. So if you're sequencing uh, at the novo genome, this is really a must. And for instance, in the picture below, you can see uh, this complex structure with three genes on opposite strands and uh, this data can help you uh, annotate these genes uh, much more nicely. So back to the three finger toxin genes. Uh, we are of course interested uh, what is lying in between those uh, genes. So in the picture below you see a fragment of 127 KB 
where four of those three finger toxin genes are located. Mm. They are on opposite strands. Um, and we can clearly see that there is a high expression uh, of those genes, which are very, is very normal in uh, venom uh, because they express not uh, a lot of genes, but they do express them very highly. Uh, we can also see uh, that there is not a lot of expression uh, between those genes. And between those genes, we uh, do find different sequences. Quite often, we found uh, the non-LTR retrotranspose on line two sequences, uh, but it's not between all of the three finger toxin genes. And we also find uh, venom metalloproteinase sequences, but again, also not between all of the genes. So for the moment, we do not really know uh, what is going on. And that should require some further investigation because next uh, we should really uh, annotate the genome properly uh, and uh, publish this as a resource that will be available to everyone uh, to research the, this, ge this uh, genome. And together with uh, Leiden University, we will further uh, study these intergenic regions to see uh, how these genes got duplicated. And with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, everyone involved in this project, especially Oxford Nanopore for providing uh, a lot of analysis and advice and also uh, chemicals that we used in sequencing this genome. At Future Genomics, uh, I would like to thank Ron and especially Susan and Wouter uh, for doing all the lab work. And at Leiden University, would like to thank uh, Michael and Freik for providing material and advice. And of course, we'd like to thank the author of Tulip, Christian Henkel, who is now at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. And with that, I say thank you.